אולייט, ערב טוב לכולם, שלום לכולם. ערב טוב, everybody תפארת, Israel Tuesday Torah Live, a new חומש, פרשת ויקרא, ספר ויקרא, חומש ויקרא, which in English called Leviticus, for obvious reasons, because the many of the מצוות and the rules and the things that are presented to us in חומש ויקרא, um, have to do with the Shevet of Levi, with the Kohanim and the Levim. Um, few interesting notes about the parasha. Okay, a few interesting notes about the parasha. Uh, we're in page 544, Vayikra Perek Aleph, Pasuk Aleph. Vayikra el Moshe, Vaydaber Adonai elav me'oel mo'ed le'emor. So Hashem called Moshe and Hashem spoke to him from the tent of meeting saying, oh, we already have to stop because Vayikra is a unique in the Torah, in the Torah, and you can see it in the, in the, in the camera, Vayikra is written with a small Aleph. Okay, it's called Aleph Zeira. And that's the way it's written in every Sefer Torah, with an Aleph Zeira. Um, since we have that Aleph Zeira, we need to understand why, what exactly is. Yes, it's in our tradition to write that Aleph with an Aleph Zeira. And so let's, we will take a look into the inside uh, of this Pasuk, because this Pasuk carries a few interesting messages. About this Vaikra el Moshe, Vaidaber Hashem elav, Meol Moed Lemo. So, first and foremost, that small little Aleph. That small little Aleph, by the way, for those who didn't see it, um, I, I'll share my screen right here and you can see it. Okay? You can see that the Aleph here is in a different font. And that's Aleph Zeira, Vaikra Hashem El Vaikra El Moshe. It's called Aleph Zeira. All right. So, what do we understand from that very little Aleph? To begin with, you know, we'll start with that story that the Midrash brings. That Hashem says Vaikra El Moshe. And Moshe didn't really want to write Vaikra because Moshe is humble. And thank you for joining. Moshe is Anav. He doesn't want to write Vaikra. Vaikra, without the Aleph, is Vaiker. Okay, without the Aleph, is Vaiker. Where do we see Vaiker? Vaiker, and what is Vaiker? Vaiker is Milshon Mikre. Milshon coincidence happened to be. That's the way uh, um, it's written for Bilam. By the way, Vayikr, Hashem appeared to Bilam, meaning Hashem wanted a certain prophet to speak to, and you know what? Bilam happened to be there. Let's see, because Rashi brings it. Vayikra el Moshe, Hashem called on to Moshe. All oral communications of Hashem to Moshe, whatever they were introduced by Daber or by Amar or by Tzav, right? We're going to see those will be the the, uh, the ways that uh, um, a conversation between Hashem and Moshe uh, will start, right? With Daber, or Tzav, or Emor. So Rashi says they were all preceded by a call to prepare him, to prepare him for that forthcoming address. Okay, so Vayikra, that we have here, first and foremost, it's written with that small aleph to teach you that it's not just here, it's everywhere. Vayikra means, hey, I call on you. I call on you. Um, I call on you by name. I call on you by choice, by selection. We call on to someone. Vayikra elav. Vayikra is Hey, Shalom Chana, Ma Shlomech. 
that's me calling to Hannah. Vayikra eleya. Calling to someone is a sign of action. Right? It's a sign of action. If I don't like you, I don't call you. And calling someone, especially inviting someone uh, by name, that is a sign of faction. And so, first and foremost, Rashi is telling us yet yeah, that small Aleph here. This is like the first time Hashem is speaking to Moshe from Oil Moed. Remember, we had, we will, we had the Mishkan, and we, next part we will talk about the Mishkan and the establishment of the Mishkan. But this is already happening. When the Mishkan is up, Oil Moed, the Kruvim, you know, the, the, the Aaron, everything is set, and Hashem is calling on to Moshe. And each and every time Hashem spoke to Moshe, first and foremost, Hashem called out, uh, called on to Moshe to prepare him. He didn't just fall on him like this to scare him. No, he called him faction. There is relationship, there is closeness here. I continue in Rashi. On Zoom, you can see the Rashi on Facebook Live. I'm, I'm reading it out loud. You can check, you can open Safaria and see the same Rashi. Uh, Safaria is a great tool to use. It is a way of express, expressing a faction, uh, the mode used by the uh, Instrument Angels when addressing each other, okay? Right? We have that in Davening, saying the angels, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. So we see the angels are using calling on to each other by name, by, by a destination. Now, to the prophets of the nations of the world, however, God revealed himself in a manner with scripture described by an expression um, ordinarily used for uh, denoting events of a casual character. Casual, of a casual character. Mikre. Okay, God happened to meet Vayiker El Bilam. Now, obviously, nothing is a happen to be by God. I mean, probably for anyone, but definitely for Hashem, everything is by design. Hashem knew he's going to speak to Bilam, but it wasn't as intentional. It wasn't intentionally by the, like speaking to Moshe. Well, what, 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 what do you mean by that? There's, no, well, but there's nothing unintentional for Hashem. You see, Hashem speaking to Moshe is by the essence of Moshe. Meaning, it's not that just Hashem wanted a prophet for Am Israel, and you know what? Moshe happened to be around. Obviously, Hashem knew that Moshe is around, but, but Moshe is not really a part of it. Moshe is just a channel. There is nothing in Moshe's sense, self, that has a connection to God. Yes, Hashem planned Moshe to be there. Hashem knew Moshe would be there. Hashem knew that he's going to talk to Bnei Israel and he'll need someone to be a function. But it's just a matter of a function. And that's the meaning of Vayiker El Bil'am. In a, um, as the English translation uh, of the Rashi, as the English translation said, in a in a uh, in a casual in a casual character, in a casual character, meaning of a casual happened to be. Hashem happened to speak to Bilam. Not that oh, Hashem ran into Bilam in Tam Tham or in the supermarket. Hey, it's Bilam. Well, I'll talk to him. Obviously, Hashem knows, and Hashem knows who Bilam is. But Bilam was just answering a certain function. Hashem wanted the Gentiles to have a prophet, to carry Hashem's word to them. Happened to be Bilam. Yes, that happened to be is by design. Hashem planned it this way. Hashem wasn't surprised by it. But Hashem didn't care about Bilam in specifics. 
Bilam happened to be the one Hashem put right there and then in time and place to be the one to fulfill that function. That's not the same with Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is chosen by specifics. There is faction. Hashem cares about Moshe. It's not just answering a function. It's the its own self sense as well is of the essence. The fact that it is Moshe Rabbeinu. So we so we understand by that the very first um, Rashi. Let's continue a little bit with that Rashi, because um, that Rashi is going to share more interesting things with us. You can see my screen. Yeah, I'll take it as a yes. Yes. Okay. Um, amen. I continue and I read Rashi out loud. Uh, God revealed himself in manner. Okay. Vaikir al Bilam. All right. So uh, happened to meet Bilam in, in, a, in a character of a of a uh, casual character, etc. etc. From the root kara, connected with Mikre, which denotes uh, which denotes chance, occurrence, happened to be. All right. Uh, also, it's a matter of impurity, by the way. Okay, it's certain uncleanness. That, that Bilam didn't have to be clean to speak to Hashem. Moshe has to prepare himself. Because there is a connection, then Hashem cares if Moshe, you know, Moshe has to be pure because you're connected to Hashem. You're not just delivering a message. So this is all hinted in that small Aleph. Vaikra el Moshe. This implies that the voice went on and reached his ears only but all the other Israelites did not hear it. Vaikra el Moshe. So the call was only to Moshe. The call is to Moshe. The rest of the people can't hear. One might think, okay, one might think that, okay, the, the, the Afsakot, there is an issue with the Afsakot. So Rashi proves there is there is there are breaks in the Torah. There are breaks in between. The Moshe got a call also when he's not in session to know that he's off. No, God calls Moshe just for speaking to him. Those breaks in between times that Hashem spoke to Moshe is for Moshe to pay attention and to think about and contemplate about what Hashem has already spoke to him. And if if uh, even more so, if this is necessary for Moshe, if this is necessary for Moshe to have reflection, time to reflect between one command, between one uh, uh, conversation with Hashem to another, how much attention we should put into it, the words of Hashem, and reflect on what we learned and think about that. Okay, beautiful educational message from Rashi. We'll move on to him. A love. A love is to him. They're intended to exclude Aaron. So the voice, only Moshe Rabbeinu hears the voice. Aaron does not hear the voice. When the prophecy is pointed directly to Moshe, it means only Moshe can hear it. The case here. We are, it's not just like in Mount Sinai, when we all heard and saw the voices and the sounds, and we, we heard Hashem speaks to us, and we heard Hashem speaks to Moshe, and Moshe speaks to us. Right now, these nevuot that are coming from the tent of meeting, from Oil Moed, these are for Moshe's ears. Now, don't think that the voice was not loud. Okay, oil moe, tent of meeting, the voice didn't come out of the tent. But don't think that the voice, okay, this teaches us that the voice broke off and did not issue beyond 
the uh, behind appointed tent. One might think that this was because the voice was very, very low one. No. The Torah, the, the holy text, however, states um, that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he entered the tent, he heard the voice. What does it mean by the voice? The voice, the voice of Hashem, that is powerful voice, right? The voice from the mountain, the voice that breaks the cedar wood and um, shakes the earth, etc., etc., etc. That voice. But that voice is only heard to Moshe Rabbeinu. And that voice is only heard in the tent. And that voice is heard from which area? This is very interesting. Uh, from which area in Ohel Moed? Book from the entire house? No. From any part of the appointed tent? No. The, the, the Torah... The text is telling us from off the covering, okay, from off the covering, from between the two cherubim, from the two cherubim. So the voice that is talking to Moshe is coming out from on top of the parochet that cover from Beina Kruvim, from in between these two angelic figures above the ark that are facing each other with the face and the wings and everything that we learned about. That is the place of where the voice is coming out from. Um, that's a very interesting Rashi right here at the very, very first Pasuk of Vayikra. Daber el b'nei Yisrael, v'amart alem, Pasuk bet. Adam ki akriv mikem korban la Adonai, min abakar u min atzon, Takrivu et korbanchem. Speak to Bnei Israel and tell them, okay, when, they, uh, when you want to present an offering to Hashem, you should choose an offering from the cattle, from the, from the flock, you can bring your offering. Let's discuss that pasuk and let's discuss that concept because it's a new concept. Okay, the Torah now is talking to us about offerings. And Sefer Vaikra, Humash Vaikra, deals with an issue that is called Avodata Korbanot, the sacrificial services, the service of offerings and sacrifices in English. And, and honestly, to us, it seems a little bit as a, at least to me, it's in a little bit as a, as a topic that is, uh, you could say, far-fetched because it's distance. It's not that we are going and, you know, with offering. I mean, we had the chili cook a few days ago and we had some meat mixed with, with sauce and great things, but um, but offerings, to go to Beit HaMikdash with an animal, to slaughter the animal and spill the blood on the Mizbeach and it seems as a complicated topic. If you think about that word of korban, korban, well, it's very interesting in Hebrew because korban, the word korban can mean few things. Or oh, the root of the word korban can, can mean few things. First, korban is a milshon leitkarev, kuf reish bet. Karov, karov and korban is, the, is actually the same word. So what is karov? What is leitkarev? Leitkarev is to draw yourself closer, to come closer. So to come close, or to come closer, or to be close, it's in the word korban. The word korban comes from the word karov. The word korban also means a sacrifice. I'm saying modern Hebrew, just like if someone pays a sacrifice, and usually it can be in a, in a, in a tragic moment, they will say korban. 
in that regard, Korban can even be a victim, right? Korbanot terror, God forbid. So the victims of terror will be Korbanot terror, Right? The victims of war will be the, the, the Korbanot HaMilchama, which will be the same as a sacrifice of war. God forbid, God forbid, God forbid. But it can issue that point of a sacrifice. It can also issue the point of krav, which means battle. It's the same word. I think that krav and karov, krav, battle, and karov, close, are actually the same word because in the ancient times to fight someone, you have to come close to them. Right? The, the war was to draw near. You draw your sword and you get close to your enemy. Whoever will be the closest will win. So I think that's the reason why it's like that. And because in war you have korban, so it all makes sense. Hebrew-wise, it makes sense. You know, today you can run a war by pressing some buttons and launching things for hundreds of miles away, not more. But um, but all those things are in the word korban, really. And so let's put the battle aside for a second. But you understand that in the very basic formation of Jewish life, a sacrifice is needed in order to draw yourself closer to God. And the sacrifice doesn't have to be in the, in the way we say sacrifice today in a, in a tragic way, chas v'chalila. But any sacrifice. Sacrifice is needed in order to come close to God. Take it back then. You know, you want to bring a, uh, a, a, a bull. Well, that's going to cost you money. That's not cheap. It wasn't cheap back then. It's, it's not cheap today, even if you live in Montana. And you have a ranch. The bull has a, uh, has a tag right here. We'll tell you how much it costs. The lamb costs money. Goats cost money. Can I ask Mr. Dubner to tell you how much it costs? So maybe one day we can fly the goats to Israel and use some of them in Beit HaMikdash, Bezrat Hashem. I have to speak to him to see if he's open for the idea. But anyhow, um, the shul is not yet taking donations in formations of animals, goats or bull or a cow or a horse. We're rather to take the check. Uh, we are not Beit HaMikdash. Um, but we understand back then Okay, you want to bring a korban, it's going to cost you something. Well, today as well, you want to come close to Hashem, it costs you something. And that's a sacrifice. And it can be the check you write to support the shul or the yeshiva or the Talmud Torah, or whatever it is. It can be the check you write for, uh, for tuition for your kids to get uh, Jewish education. It's a sacrifice. You want to teach your kids and, and raise them to be close to Hashem and it's going to cost you. Waking up to Minyan in the morning is a sacrifice as well. And you could stay in bed for another hour. And you don't have to get out and get dressed and, and go out and it's still dark and it's cold. And then the rabbi is going to speak after Minyan, and then uh, the whole thing takes too long. And so it's a sacrifice. Pesach, are well, you going to stop eating your, uh, your, your bread, whatever it is? The special sprout bread, 70 calories per piece. Very soft and nice. Easy to digest. 
And instead you're going to eat matzah and then suffer for three weeks. And it's a sacrifice. Right? You want to you wanna celebrate uh, Hanukkah even? Are you going to eat all these donuts, tons of oil and jelly? It's a sacrifice. It's a major sacrifice. So bringing yourself close to Hashem, however you look at it, and thank you, Monica, for joining. Um, bringing yourself close to Hashem, it's a sacrifice. It's, it's, it's always the stuff you miss. You celebrate Shabbat, which is a great pleasure and, and an amazing thing. But also sometimes it's a sacrifice. What can you do? It can be a long Shabbat. Motei Shabbat can be at 8.30. And your AC is not working the best. And it's hot outside. And you already want to shower the kids and put Disney Channel on and get some quiet. I don't know. It's a sacrifice. And so that's the very first understanding. Adam ki akriv mikem korban la Adonai. Mikem. From you. You want to bring from you closeness to Hashem. Well, that's going to cost whatever it is in those um, earthly figures to achieve that spiritual closeness. Now, the word mikem, mikem, Adam ki akriv mikem. When a man among you brings an offering to Hashem, what, what is the word mikem? teaching us here because me came well obviously okay so you can't bring something that is not yours you can steal something and bring it to a chef there is this whole issue of of mitzvah baba veda of mitzvah that comes on a on a vehicle of a sin you can't steal a lamb and sacrifice it to god it's not yours okay but there is this issue. There is this issue, um, and we can see it in the next sukim. There is this issue of of lirzonchem. There is this issue again of ratzon. Ratzon is your motivation, your desire, your drive. Bringing a korban has to be done with the right thought intention and emotion and by the way that's the proof from the torah you know sometimes it happens when i speak to students sometimes and they say well i i'm i'm not in charge on my on my feelings i that's what i feel and that's it well the, but that's wrong according to the torah yes you are maybe it's hard to control your feelings Maybe it's hard to direct your feelings which direction to go. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's totally in your control. If controlling your emotion was not a thing, then Hashem wouldn't command you to love Hashem and to think about and feel few, several things when you bring a koba. What you need to think and what you need to feel Yes, they are in your control. Just like your thoughts are in your control, your emotions are in your control. Eventually, you decide what to love and what to hate. Maybe you got to invest work in doing it. But it is in your control. Okay, the biggest sign for that is that Hashem created us with the brain on top of everything else. Because the brain is in charge. So the brain will tell you what to feel. Maybe naturally you feel something towards something, but you can eventually control it. Again, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not now entering to the full uh, uh, understanding of, of, of where that can lead, but bringing a korban has to be uh, um, something that connects eventually um, uh, mentally in your head, Certain thought that you have to think about the korban, and and it's it's there to operate your heart to feel a certain way. Bringing just the korban without those things, 
we can see what he does. I'll share the screen again. Okay. I'm showing to you a psukim from Isaiah. Famous psukim from Isaiah, um, chapter one, as a matter of fact, verse 11. למה לרוב זבחיכם יאמר אדוני? סבעתי עולות אלים וחלב מרעים ודם פרים מוכבסים ועתודים לא חפצתי. What need have I of all your sacrifices? says Hashem. You can see it as a question now. Am I getting full or I'm fed up with your burnt offerings, with the rams, you know, with the blood of the goats, of the da 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 da. I don't need all that. כי תבואו לראות פניי מי ביקש זאת מידכם רמוס חצרי. That you come to appear before me, who asked that of you to trample over my court? לא תוסיפו אבי מנחת שווא. No more bringing false offerings. This is abomination for me. I don't like you. ראש חודש, I don't like you. שבס. I, I don't like you Rosh Chodesh, I don't like you holidays. What I like is for you to wash yourselves clean, put your evil doing away from my sight, and cease to do evil. Learn to do good, devote yourself to justice, etc., etc. These very harsh words, the prophet Isaiah, are at the other end of that line of korbanot, of sacrifices, or the service, or the, 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 the services of the, the offerings in Beit HaMikdash. If they are not done right, Hashem has no need. Hashem doesn't eat the meat, doesn't drink the blood. Hashem has no need of this entire thing. The entire purpose of the korban is that through that, the person will come close to Hashem. אז רב אליהו וואנס, רב מרדכי אליהו, זכר צדיק וקדוש לברכה, לחיי העולם הבא, זכותו יבוא לישראל אמן. רב אליהו described it once to us, um, how does this, you know, and he describes it, it's so funny, you know, and everybody are laughing, it's Shabbat afternoon, and he's giving the best show in town, in Jerusalem, so there are many other great shows in town. Um, and, and, and he explains in the shiur, how someone, has a, someone commit a sin, and he, he wants, you know, he's going to bring a sin offering. So that person is going to go to Jerusalem. So he's going to go to the market where you can buy the sacrifices. You can buy the animals that you will later on sacrifice. So he goes to the market. No, he doesn't know what, what kind of an offering he needs to bring. He's not an expert for offerings. But in that market, you have uh, counselors, right? You have like young Levites that are experts in the halachot, and like this young rabbi of Shevet Levi. And so they have like information, they have a front desk, whatever, the person goes there. And he sees this, this young fellow. He's a Levi, he's a, maybe he has a certain uh, tag, or you know, you can go and ask him his information. So the person goes, sorry, can you direct me to the uh, sin offerings? I need to bring a sin offering. The person says, oh, yeah. okay, let's, let's see what, what you need. What you do? What happened with you? I need to know the, the case. I'll give you a case number. So the person starts to tell this youngster everything that happened. And I was like, oh, I can't believe you did this. You did that, whatever. OMG, look at what you need. It's going to give him a note with the, whatever offering that guy needs to bring. You know, say, you see over there, go down, down, make a right, and then you can ask. Right? Because it's Israel. So it's not going to direct him immediately to the place. It's going to send him to the direction, hoping he'll find another guy. So this guy is going to go down the market and going to find another young levy. And say, well, your friend told me to go down. I said, ah, there are a few places right here. You got to tell me what you did. Is it, uh, it's like I have a case number. So we don't work with case numbers. You just tell me what is it. And he tells him the whole story again, the whole thing. He's for sure starting to repent. Then he says, oh, that's what he did here. Come, I'll take you. He takes him to the place. 
There is a Kohen there, he sells you the animal. I was like, hey, he needs a so-and-so. I was like, yeah, why? why? Why does he need it? Now it's the third person now hears the story. Then he's going to get the lamb or the ram or whatever he needs. I'm going to start dragging that thing to Beit HaMikdash, which I'm sure that's not easy as well. And if he's going to ask some other Levim or other Israelis to help him, he'll have to tell them the story again for the fifth and the sixth and the seventh time. Then he gets to Beit HaMikdash already after slapping that animal around. He's for sure say whatever he did, it's not worth it. And he gets to Beit HaMikdash. And he has to stand in line. And eventually it's his turn. And the Kohen tells him what you do, confess what you did. And he's telling the Kohen the whole story again. But this time it's in Beit HaMikdash and the Kohen is dressed. And the person already regrets and he feels it. And the Kohen says, you should know when you, when we're going to slaughter the animal, you should feel it's been done to you. All this is happening to this innocent animal because of you. And that person has to put his hands on top of the animal and confess what he did and understand that that animal is going to pay the price, but blood is going to be spilled. And this entire process eventually is by design to awaken that person's heart. So the Koban, without the heart, is worth nothing. That's exactly what Prophet Isaiah is telling us. Hashem is telling me, I don't need your stuff. You're sitting home doing terrible sins and you're Ubering animals to Beit HaMikdash. Uber eats. You're sending, hey, let's have a crazy party. Instead of a holiday, I'll send five rams. It doesn't work like this in our religion. You don't meet someone and says, hey, that's what I've done and say, okay. Write a check and it's it's dissolved, it's forgiven. I mean, it would have been great if it worked like that. That would be an amazing fundraiser opportunity for the show. Can you imagine? People come here, whatever they did, they write a check, it's done. I'll talk to Ed and Dr. Goldfein about it. Um, but anyhow, this idea just came to my mind. Um, but anyhow, Obviously, it doesn't work like this. And the, the whole matter here is the matter of the heart and the intention. If the person thinks one thought that is not supposed to be for the Koban, disqualifies the whole thing. The person thinks, ah, whatever. Well, ah, that's it. Go, go, go do it again. The person thinks, you know what? I should take part of that meat and bring it home down south. Ah. You're going to disqualify the whole thing. You got to hold your thought. You got to hold your emotion. Instead, you got to, you got to keep yourself intact. It's a tremendous lesson of self-control. Every Koba. It's a tremendous lesson of the power of speech. How do you make that Koban a Koban? Person want to bring a burnt offering to the Mikdash. He takes the cow from the herd. You know, maybe pulls the cow in the ear and says, this is an Ola. Boom, that cow now is holy. Can't do work with it. Don't take its milk. Don't da, 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 da. That's it. This cow is an elevated status just because you said something. Still a cow. It's going to behave exactly like any other cow, including everything. But now the status of the cow changed by the power of your word. So this is for the Mikdash. Boom. I don't know, you said three words. Complete change of status. With laws and, 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 and what happened if you messed up and how much compensation you got to donate. If something happened to this cow, you, you're responsible. It's going to be redeemed with a check plus extra 25% plus whatever. It's the whole thing. Just by your words. See how much goes into a korban. We shouldn't think of it as a primitive thing. Oh, it's so primitive and dark. So ancient times, taking a cow and slaughtering it on a, on a big altar, draining its blood, burning the flesh. I'm getting hungry as I speak. 
but you should see it as a tremendous learning opportunity, lesson that is involved, yes, to create the real effect and the shock there will be blood being drawn and spilled. Flesh will be burnt. There's not a lesson that you hear about and that's it. You're going to hear it. You're going to see it happening. You're going to confess on it. You're going to hold your thought, hold your words, hold your emotions. You're going to see the blood being spilled. You're going to smell the flesh in different kobanot. You might eat part of it. You eat part of the meat, the holy meat from the Mizbeach, and you become holy. It actually elevates you spiritually. I don't know which, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a concept that blows my mind. Can you imagine eating barbecue meat makes you, elevates you spiritually? In other places in the world that tell you fasting elevates you spiritually. No wonder everything, every Jewish activity has to be involved with food. It's in the very basic of our being. To elevate the reality. That's a way to elevate the reality. You take a cow, it was a cow. Now it's all the spiritual sparks of it being sent to Hashem. Yeah, yeah, the cow, the cow was slaughtered. I understand. And you know what? I guess that's why Hashem created that very specific cow. And it fulfilled its purpose in the world. That's beautiful. All the holy sparks were elevated. Now, it teaches us something about tefillah. Because today we don't have korbanot like that. And again, unfortunately, we've seen korbanot. And, and, and again, the, the Hebrew word of korbanot today, and and, and Geveret Chana, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, for Hebrew speakers to hear korbanot, when you put it in the context of the news and, and the person from the Dizengoff uh, Center terror attack from a week ago that passed away today. And, and you know that when you say Korbanot today, that, that's, it comes to mind. It's even a word that unfortunately, because of the reality, got kind of a tragic connotation and connection. And yes, these are korbanot. You know, the people who died in those recent terror attacks, the brothers, twice we had brothers uh, that got killed in, in terror attacks in Israel just because they were Jewish. I mean, in the past few weeks, and should be no more. And they are korbanot, actual sacrifices for the entire nation of Israel. That no one chose for them to be sacrificed, but they died because they were Jews that live in Israel and and try to catch a ride in Jerusalem or someplace in Samaria. It should be safe for us. So I can't ignore that because when you say Korbanot, for any Hebrew speaker, it comes to mind. But eventually, Korbanot in the good way, in the good and peaceful way, Korbanot are those sacrifices that the person has to be aware of the fact that he's placing that sacrifice and have it in tune with the right words and, and the right thoughts and the right feelings. And it doesn't matter if that sacrifice is a lamb or a ram or an hour and a half of sleep. Whatever it is should be in the mind, in the heart, in the mouth. It should be given voluntarily with the desire of the heart and with the intention of the mind and with the right words and beautiful and loving and caring words to Hashem. And so after all that, Hashem will consider to accept it. Because Hashem doesn't need anything from us. Now, when we don't have Korbanot of Beit HaMikdash today, our sages were very clear in the Talmud that the davening, the davening in, in, in many parts, the davening, the tefillah, is corresponding to, or it's it's in lieu of the korbanot. We don't have the sacrificial work, services in Beit Hamikdash. We have the services in Shul. And many things in the system of the tefillah, in the system of davening, are taken from Beit Hamikdash. The times, 
שחרית and mincha are corresponding to the korban atamid, to the tamid offering twice a day, once early in the morning, once in the afternoon. The times of fila are, are taken from the times that were available for these offerings. Mariv is from the extra whatever that needed to be burnt throughout the night of the Mizbeach. So it doesn't have set time. It's the entire night. Because if you had a lot of offerings, the Mizbeach will continue to burn stuff the entire night. So many things in the system of davening are taken from the system of that sacrifices uh, the service of the offerings in Beit HaMikdash. And many things of the essence as well. Just like tefillah, just like a korban, an empty korban, Hashem doesn't need. Hashem doesn't drink the blood from the lamb, doesn't eat the meat, doesn't eat the barbecue scent. It's the same for the words of davening. Words of davening can be, of well, tefillah, can be something without any intention and emotion. You know, I can say the old davening right now on, on, on autopilot. You know, like you can put the quarter here, pull that ear, and I'll start. I can say it. I know it by heart. Wake me up in the middle of the night. I know it. I can go a whole davening again. I mean, I know, oh my God, what am I thinking about? Thinking about this, the football game there, and I didn't call that. And, you know, there's a famous joke that, that if you forgot something, go daven Amida, you'll remember. Suddenly in Amida, oh my God, I forgot to send an email. Mora Gale is waiting for an email and I forgot to. Can reach my hand to my phone right now. Stand it while I'm davening Amida. So the Yetzirah brings suddenly out. Now I found the car keys, right? When I lost the car keys, I said, okay, go daven Mincha, you'll find the car keys. Suddenly in Amida, oh, I remember what the car is. And I remember that I didn't wash the car. I didn't change the sticker. Got to do many things. Suddenly in Amida, I remember everything. It's like, a, it's like a mystical thing. But that's exactly why, because the Yetzer doesn't want to let the davening go undisturbed just like that. person has to put effort. Tefillah cannot be empty words. The heart, the mind, the mouth, those three things that are working in the Korban are the same for Tefillah. She doesn't need the songs unless they come with the right emotion, right intention, and then the words can be acceptable in front of Hashem. May Hashem accept all of our tefillot and our songs in the beautiful, small, little, pleasant sacrifices, and there will be no more need of those big sacrifices of the Israeli Jewish nation that will all be alive, well, intact, happy, and well. And the sacrifice will be that we put bread for a week and we eat matzah instead. Those sacrifices should be the ones that Hashem desired to get and that we happy uh, and healthy to give. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, everybody for joining.